I'd like to thank everyone joining us. Welcome to today's CNCF webinar, DevOps from a different data set. What 11 million workflows reveal about high-performing teams. I'm Libby Schultz. I'll be moderating today's webinar. We'd like to welcome our presenter today, Michael Stonkey, VP of Platform at Circle CI, and Ron Powell, Technical Content Marketing Manager at Circle CI. Couple housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you're not able to talk as an attendee, but there is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Separate from the chat box, there's a Q&A box. That's where you wanna go. Please feel free to drop your questions in there and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF code of conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that code of conduct. Basically, be respectful of all your fellow participants and presenters. Please also note that recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF webinar page at cncf.io slash webinars. With that, I will hand it over to Michael and Ron to kick off today's presentation. All right, thank you so much. Uh, well, let's get started, I guess. That's probably the, be the best thing to jump into. Um, so I wanna talk about kind of a giant data set for how we analyze performance and what we see in terms of teams and the industry as a whole. And so this is going to cover basically three different uh, sections where we have kind of the setup a little bit about the data and how we gathered that data. And then we have the data itself, which is kind of the readout of here's what we found. And then we have insights based on what you found in the data. You know, what can you infer from that? What can you correlate with it? What can you kind of um, extrapolate from the data that we see? So from a setup perspective, um, you know, what are we talking about and how does this work? Well, there's a lot of data out here on DevOps and team performance and things like that. And a lot of this started from Puppet's work uh, starting in 2011, coming all the way up through 2020. I believe the 2020 report actually came out today. So, uh, you know, and I've been a part of this report for a number of years. And I've always been interested to hear how team performance works and to get those responses back. This is done through surveys. But one of the things that was really interesting to me when I came to Circle CI was now I'm not just talking about surveys, now I'm talking about actual data sets that are here that I can look at to see how teams are working and what they're really doing beyond just answering some questions. Not that questions are bad and they can tell you a whole lot about how teams are working, but this is a different angle to kind of look at the same set of problems and the same area and see, okay, what are teams doing? How do they behave? What are they, do they actually push code as often as they claim they do? Do they uh, you know, what do their CI workflows kind of look like in terms of duration or how often they're running them? So I like to think of this as performance derived versus performance described. So in, in a survey, we're asking participants to describe their performance. They tell us how they feel about it, how it's working, you know, what they do. And there can always be recency bias there. There can be, well, I'm excluding things that I don't like. And so I'm only going to write about the things that we're really good at. Um, whereas when it's derived, what we see is the set of all things going on on the platform, which does skew numbers in different ways, because a lot of those questions are phrased in for the primary application or service you work on, tell us about, you know, X, Y, and Z. And so for us, we wanted to derive that. And which means that we look at, you know, if you're an organization, we might look at everything going on in your organization. And it turns out if you have one of those, you know, repositories that only gets run in CI once a month and is usually sitting there in a red state, we catch that. That may not be something that enters your mind when you're filling out a survey question. So this data set, it was 44,000 organizations and 160,000 projects. And so this makes it about a thousand times larger than all the state of DevOps surveys that have been done. And again, this is just a massive amount of data and that's what makes it interesting. And so we started doing this last year uh, where, you know, as, when I came over to Circle CI, this was one of the initial questions that I had was, hey, can we get it? We slice and dice this data set and uh, Ron and I took it apart and kind of looked at it and we had some help from the data team and, uh, you know, it was a lot of fun. And then this year it was kind of, well, what's changed, you know, well, I mean, 2020 has been a year like no other. So we imagine there's some inputs that, you know, would definitely change things over time and we'll definitely see some of that in the data, but I don't think, um, you know, so kind of in year two, you can look at what's changed in the baseline, I guess, from year one. So this is our our, our second year of analysis, um, basically the data set's a little bit larger in a 30 day set than it was a, a year ago. And that's mostly from growth of Circle CI on, on just our customers and, and usage there. Um, and so in a lot of cases, you know, there were four classic metrics that were in these DevOps surveys and DevOps reports. And that was basically your deployment frequency, recovery from failure time, your change failure rate and your lead time. 
And for us, we took these numbers and kind of thought, well, how do these map into a world where software developers are using a CI platform versus, you know, just kind of the overall software delivery as a whole? Because they're not, those are not one-to-one -one analogous in all cases. In a lot of cases, they're quite close. And in other cases, you may have to do a little bit of, uh, you know, mapping to kind of, to kind of get where those metrics come from. And so, um, we kind of took the state of DevOps report metrics that were the four on the far left of your screen. And then, then we map them to the metrics that we use for Circle CI, which is on the right of your screen. And in the middle, you can see, you know, kind of a little bit more of a description here where deployment frequency kind of changed into how often you initiate your pipelines, lead time to change turned into pipeline duration, change failure rate was pipeline failure rate and MTTR was time from red to green. So recovery time. Um, and so we, we refer to these in, in pretty simple terms as throughput, duration, success rate, and recovery time. So now let's get into the data. Here's, here's what this data tells us um, on throughput. So this is how often do you push code that triggers CI? Um, originally, this was kind of how often do you commit, but then we realized that commits can sometimes be grouped and pushed into CI all at once and not always be running all, all at the same time. So uh, most projects are run to you know, run to, to basically run their CI per push to the Git server. Some are doing it on a schedule, but most often it's, it's usually per push up to the, to, the, to the Git server. And so what we see is, you know, at the 50th percentile, you're basically getting a point, a point seven, um, point seven times a day people are running, <laughs> which is uh, not a lot. So a lot, of, a lot of things are not happening as often as you might have imagined. But then you can see that there's, you know, at the 95th percentile, somebody is running CI on a project 32 times a day. And, and uh, you know, it's above that even higher. So, but the mean is really sitting around eight. And that's because of those 90, 90 plus percentiles, there's a lot of, there's a lot of projects that are sitting there, um, you know, at the higher ends too. So, um, but most projects are not really deploying dozens of times per day. They're not even validating their software dozens of times a day. And so we can derive that, you know, a lot of the descriptions of high performing teams it doesn't mean those aren't true. It just means that it may be one project that's really moving that fast, but a whole bunch of other projects that they have really aren't moving that fast. And so you kind of have to look at the total sample of everything going on within an engineering department versus maybe just their, their single focus or their, their primary thing. And so that's, that's kind of why this gets different is because you have these questions phrased in what's the primary application or service you work on as opposed to us looking at, you know, say every repository in your GitHub organization, which again, you're gonna have different characteristics when you look at it from that sample. So how does this compare to 2019? Well, you can see that, you know, things are a little bit, are a little bit, um, I guess I would say a little bit, uh, they're, uh, they're kicking off a little more often in, tw in 2020 versus 2019. Um, sorry, I was at the 0.7 versus 0.8 was throwing me off because that's the one that went the other direction. But um, but uh, yeah, so th so people are really leaning into CI in 2020, and that, that's not surprising to see a little bit a little bit more focus on automation, a little more focus on standardized delivery throughout the software lifecycle. Um, and so those leveraging CI are doing well, and some of them are doing even more with CI than than they already were. And so while 2019 CI was very popular, I think. The investment in automation has continued through 2020, and we'll definitely see that as we move into the insights portion toward the, you know, the, the latter third of the, of the presentation. Um, there are also fewer developers worldwide pushing code, and that's one of the things we're seeing as well, um, which again, if you, if you factor in 2020 overall in the economic climate, you can imagine that there are probably fewer software developers pushing code, but that doesn't actually necessarily equate to less code volume. It just equates to you know, fewer contributors on the, I guess, you know, in the, in the commit logs. So duration, how long does it take to get results? Um, this is something that we take near and dear to our hearts because it, it, you know, we want you to get feedback as fast as you can from a, you know, when you're running your validation suite or whatever you're doing with your CI system. And what we see is 5% of builds finish in less than 12 seconds, which you think, well, 5%, that doesn't sound like very much. It's about 500,000 builds in this sample. So it's not a small number, even when it says something like 5%. Then you ask, well, what can you get done in 12 seconds? And the answer is probably not a lot, but some people can do quite a bit. Um, you know, if you have many unit tests that can be parallelized, maybe you can run a whole unit test suite. If you're uploading an artifact into, you know, an S3 bucket to get it ready for deployment, you can probably do that in less than 12 seconds, assuming the artifact isn't too large. Um, and so sometimes these are steps in, in a larger, you know, set of things that work all together. And sometimes it's, you know, all we do is run our tests really quickly and that's really cool. Um, 
so in 2020, you can see that around the 50th percentile, you're right around that four minute mark. And that feels pretty good. I mean, that's some good engineering going on if you're getting meaningful signal in four minutes. I know as a developer, I would be often thrilled if I could get my, my first set of feedback in four minutes of whether or not something I did was working or not. Um, you know, and then you can see that the 95th percentile is sitting here at, at 34 minutes. Um, there are a lot of companies that would be very, very pleased with even a 34 minute return for signal, um, you know, depending on what you're building and what your test scenarios are and the complexity of those and the thoroughness of them you can be all over the place. Uh, one of the places I used to work, I was looking at seven or eight hours to get this kind of feedback. If I could get that in 34 minutes, it would have made every developer we have very, very happy. But like I said, half of all, half of all builds are finishing in under four minutes, which you know I think there's a lot of people really engineering to try and get their test suite durations lower. And that's really important. Um, I definitely have seen teams that have kind of SLOs around their test time. And if it gets out of bounds, it might be four minutes, it might be eight minutes, it might be 10 minutes. But if they get past the amount of time it takes to get them the feedback they want, they kind of stop engineering and just start re-engineering the test suite to make it go faster or remove flaky tests or fix flaky tests or, you know, invest in more parallelization or in better setup handling, things like that. Um, I just can't put enough emphasis on how, how much fast feedback will increase your overall throughput for your development team. So in a year, there's not really a big significant change here. Um, you can see that, you know, generally the durations have gone up just a tiny bit. It could be that people have added more tests. And so they're doing a little richer validation than what they were doing in the past. Um, the one thing that is interesting to point out, though, is that um, the mean is actually a little bit shorter. And so, you know, what you can see is. While many at many percentiles it's running longer, you know, somewhere in there, those longest running ones are maybe not as long as they used to be because some people have done some engineering or there's just a little more weight at the bottom end of the scale because people have, have invested in it. So, um, you know, again, not a significant difference from 2019 to 2020, but pretty cool overall to, to look at things, you, you know, adding a little bit of time, but in the mean, no, it's still going down. From a success rate standpoint, we're looking at how often does your pipeline complete with a green status? Uh, a pipeline can compete with complete with either red, green, or error. And error just means incomplete. We couldn't do something, and and that can happen in any CI system. You know, it could be that um, an external resource was not reachable. It could be that you you were put in an impossible scenario, a test divided by zero, and blew up the whole thing. You know, things like that. Um, but for us, for success rates, you know, at the fiftieth percentile, we're seeing sixty one percent of all pipelines. Are, are passing in green. And you can see that even at the, at the lower and higher end, these numbers become less meaningful in that there's a group of, of things that never ever fail and there's a group of things that always fail. Um, and so for those, you know, once you throw those out, you can see that kind of in the middle, you know, 54% of builds are passing so that, you know, roughly one out of every two builds is passing. Um, and so basically what this also tells us is that sometimes people are just dabbling with CI, like maybe they're setting up a project, it fails once or twice, and that's the end of them using it for a while for that project. Maybe they don't get back to it in that this month of sample. You know, it could have been, this was a, uh, you know, one of those 20% time projects and somebody just didn't have the time to get back to it until the next month or a few months later, or, you know, they started a different repository where they solved the problem in a whole new way. And this one just sits there as registering as a failed pipeline for quite a long time. Um, and yeah, some of our samples saw no failures within a month as we covered. So the delta between uh, 2019 and 2020, very little difference, which I wouldn't expect there to actually be a lot of difference here. Um, you know, we get a 1% improvement uh, year over year in terms of the success rate at the 50th percentile and the rest of it's pretty much identical. Um, if you dig into it a little bit more, like if you slice and dice the percentiles a little bit, you do see that toward the higher end, things are improving where you're getting 89% versus 86 or 100 at the 85th percentile. But again, this is, you know, while, while interesting, I don't think it's that significant overall year over year to say that behavior has changed in a massive way from 2019 to 2020. Uh, recovery time is the time a pipeline sits in a failure state. And so... In the fifth percentile, you'll see it's at two minutes that it'll sit in a failure state before it's recovered. A lot of times in those scenarios, that could be from multiple contributions running in parallel where, you know, developer one pushes a bad, a bad commit, developer two pushes a good commit, the bad commit fails really quickly, and then the good commit succeeds right afterwards. Um, it could be the same developer. <laughs> so, um, 
you know, at the 55th, at the 50th percentile, you're seeing about an hour of time until it's, until it's recovered properly. And then after that, you start to see things that are um, probably more attributed to, uh, you, you push some code and then you go home and come back the next day and check on it, or you come back over the weekend and check on it even. Um, and that's where that 14.85 hours comes in is kind of the, well, I pushed some code at the end of the day, I'll look at it tomorrow or I'll deal with it tomorrow. And you know, 14 hours is about the time of the end of somebody's work day until the next start in a weekday scenario. Um, yeah, and so this is kind of calling out that giant gap between the 50th and 75th percentile is that it looks like people just kind of go home. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so and that's interesting because I think if you look at classic continuous delivery philosophy, you would say, well, you can't go home if the build's red. But I think there's also kind of some uh, pragmatism about that where when you say the build, is it the most important build or is it you know a scratch build or is it a test build or is it a feature branch build or whatever? And so um, I don't think I'm here to judge somebody who decides to go home and then come back the next day to work on their build if that's you know acceptable for their business climate. So. Um, and this, this has changed overall in 2020. Recovery time has definitely in, uh, decreased. And so it's moving the right direction for 2020. And again, I could hypothesize on this a little bit and say maybe it's because more people are home and more attentive to what's going on uh, with the code. And there's maybe less, uh, oh, I was going to look at that, but I ended up getting a coffee with somebody for an hour and a half, uh, you know, kind of thing at the office. So we have seen you know, a, a fastest recovery time improving uh, year over year. And then the last thing we want to get to is kind of the insights. So, you know, we talked a little bit about how we gathered the data. We we've, we've talked a little bit about uh, the data and what it told us itself. But really, this is the more interesting part of the discussion is what can you derive from this data or what kind of things, you know, jump out at us. And in this part, I'll invite Ron to come in and have more conversation with me because I'm tired of talking to you all just straight up. Um, I, I don't need to be a broadcast. And you know, we'll get some of the, what's interesting about this data set, I think is really what we'll start to find out. So, um, you know, 2020 has been a year like no other, like we've said. And, and I think that, you know, we just can't, we can't look at this data and not think about, well, what's the impact of the of a global pandemic? What does that have on team performance? So, um, Ron, I don't know if you want me to walk through slides. You just want to kind of answer some questions really quickly, but uh, what have you seen for the pandemic? Uh, I mean, I, I, I think going through some slides or, or just answering questions would be just fine. Uh, the pandemic, I mean, like, you know, what I think with this slide here representing throughput uh, on the left, we have our data from 2019. We recorded uh, a month of data for the month of March, April, and May. So in the middle of this plot are points for March, April, and May. And then on the right is our August of 2020 data. And so, uh, I mean, at many of the uh, uh, percentiles, we see that the maximum throughput uh, was reached in April, uh, or would, would have been in May. And so, I mean, we think that this absolutely makes sense uh, in the face of global economic uncertainty. Uh, I think that it is very wise for us to take our engineering teams and shore up business interests. Uh, to me, this looks a lot like, uh, you know, uh, automating as much as I possibly can. My workforce is about to go home. Uh, and so I need this to be done as quickly as I can, that that application as quickly as possible. It also looks to me like uh, resolving bug tickets, resolving issues, like uh, making sure that I can really lean on my on the stability of my platform. And so, uh, and then we also need to get this done right away, right? So one thing that we also notice through this period is that throughput increases uh, you know, on Saturday and Sunday and well outside of the normal hours of operation, uh, which is, is also expected. Uh, this was not something that any of us were relatively prepared for. And so to see uh, so many teams jump on this opportunity to really try to build their engineering organization, their, use their engineering organizations to shore up their business uh, makes complete sense. And look at the next one. Do you think that uh, on the weekends, maybe some of that was even just people kind of toying and play, being more hobbyists because they couldn't go out and uh, travel or do, you know, go out to the bar or whatever else they could have done? You know, I like this as an idea because I, I also think, you know, what the economic uncertainty and the pandemic caused was a lot of folks to be at home. And so the folks at home, I mean, the technophiles, that sort of, of group uh, is going to lean into the internet, lean into the projects that they work on. Uh, 
I know that I, when I, in, in times of anxiety, I lean into the things that I do really well. Uh, it is, you know, developing applications. It is resolving bugs. It is those types of things. And so that, you know, some of this could be, you know, just wanting to like create some stability and some familiarity in your life while the world is rapidly changing. And so that would show up as well as evening hour operations. It would also show up as things over the weekend. And so the, you know, all of that together, I think, combines to seeing, you know, the throughput increase significantly for those times. And then, you know, while the year over year is higher, uh, it's not as high as it as as the month of May. May the month of May was where we saw our peaks. Yeah, yeah. Through April and May, we definitely saw our peaks. Um, you know, I think it was late April, early May was yeah. really when yeah. kind of the, kind of the peaks happened. And, you know, that was primary lockdown for at least north of, most of North America, most of Europe at that time. Um, and so we just saw just a whole lot more code going on the system. And, you know, as we entered into that, that time of uncertainty, you know, we didn't really know what was going to happen on Circle CI, the platform either. And so we were watching and, and, and learning from it just as much as everybody else. I think one of the other interesting things that I was able to notice as, you know, I run the SRE area uh, of Circle is we could see that the the amount of traffic, the scheduling, like the patterns on the traffic throughout the week had changed. It used to be like kind of peak windows were they were, you know, maybe 12 hours throughout the day and it, they ended up being more like 14 by the end of that, where, you know, you were getting an extra hour or two of peak traffic time every day on the platform, which was, again, maybe it's because people aren't commuting now. And so they're using that time to work or, you know, whatever it is. But um, so after, yeah, after April or early May, um, depending on how you're looking at the graph, <laughs> um, throughput falls just a little bit. And you know, that could be people being like, wow, I'm burning myself out or I'm working too much or I need to do other things or, you know, mental health problems or mental health issues. Anxiety can, can you know, raise pretty, pretty high when you're sitting at home for uh, multiple months in a row. And I think people need to understand that and take a break and give themselves the space they need. And it looks like that happened. And we definitely saw, you know, even in June, the traffic um, definitely was lower and people were starting to take days off, even if they couldn't, you know, go travel and take vacation. It was just, wow, I need to be away from the computer for a little while, uh, which is all great. Um, and so what can you tell me about duration here, Ron? You no, know, I think that the duration, you know, the mean looks like it falls. I mean, it, it, it falls a little bit, but, you know, for 50th percentile and above, we see duration uh, increasing, you know, year over year, and then having the longest runs uh, around the time of, of April and May when we saw the peak throughput. And so, you know, this makes sense to me. If bit shoring up your business is the main goal in this, in this type of environment, then I, I would imagine that looks to me like adding more tests to my CI suite. Uh, now, fine tuning my test might be the second thing that I do. And so seeing a drop right after that might be representative of, you know, first I write all of my tests, then I increase parallelization or I start running tests on larger machine sizes or I make those types of optimization changes. But right away, I need to make sure that like the, 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 the application that I'm creating is as stable as it possibly can. And stability to me looks like running tests. Mm -hmm. And so it makes sense to me that I'm seeing this uh, increase during this time in which the throughput was also higher. And then it also makes sense to me that it would fall slightly after that. Um, and then that we, we talked a little bit about duration increasing year over year, but not to an enormously large amount. This is in seconds on the uh, Y axis there. So the 2,000, 2,500 seconds. Um, it's not incredibly large, but like that we were still able to pull out a signal from the months that we thought were of interest here and that that signal says that things were running slightly longer, uh, like that, that, that does look to us like uh, that this is, um, supports the shoring up of, of business interests and it supports that through, this is likely due to adding more tests. Yeah, I think another hypothesis that we could have on this is, you know, a lot of organizations have a lot of side projects, I would say, um, you know, where they're doing something and maybe those are running a little less often. They probably don't have as detailed the test coverage as the main important business features. And so those are probably the things that are really dominating, you know, the lion's share of the CI for each of those organizations. And so, you know, that you can see that raising the duration a little bit too. And of course they're investing in that and adding more tests and all that, because a lot of companies went back to basically what's my core principle, what's my core business objective, um, you know, during this time of economic uncertainty. So a lot of this says basically what Ron just said. <laughs> so, um, 
yeah, we see a concentrated effort starting in April, you know, an optimization where after duration goes up, you start to see people saying, wow, I don't like my duration creeping up. I'm going to start working on, uh, you know, making these tests run a little bit faster or removing the tests that are giving me signal that is unimportant or, or whatever. Uh, what's different about success rate through the pandemic, Ron? Sure. Success rates, I mean, when, you know, we saw that the really the interesting places in success rate are the mean and the 50th percentile. Uh, there are some things that are always green. There are some things that are always red. And so uh, what I see is like to get an uptick in uh, in success rate in 50 percent success rate, 60 percent is, is about what we measured uh, year over year. The that success rate says that people are innovating. Uh, you innovate you, like innovation is going to look the signal that 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 provides is a failed build. Uh, at least on occasion, like innovation should look like red to green, red to green, red to green, that type of cycle. But no one is, expects every commit to be perfect every single time. And so a nice, healthy innovation uh, environment for your engineering team does look like, uh, you know, a somewhat high degree of failure. But when we see things like a peak, when we see things like a signal that, that, that where the success rate is increasing, on teams, you know, the 50th percentile, the mean, we expect that to be your average, uh, you know, engineering team. To see that increase says to me that, that, that in, in innovation is likely uh, stalling. And maybe it's not stalling, but maybe it's taking a backseat to what we described earlier, shoring up business uh, needs and resolving issues, resolving bugs. Resolving issues, resolving bugs often does it is, is, I mean, you're going from red to green. You're trying to get more stability in your system. And so we would expect that that behavior would also see a peak in, 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 uh, in innovation or not in innovation, but in, in success rate. Uh, we see that you know, fall down a little bit afterwards. And the expectation is that once you get your business stable again, now we're back to feature branch development. Now we're back to doing these innovative, innovative things. Now we're back to testing optimization strategies, right? Stonk, you mentioned that that was also likely what occurred uh, you know, after we write all of these tests, then we go in and we optimize those things uh, that would also be available to engineering teams if innovation was something that was start, you know, something that was not necessarily the highest priority as teams were moving towards making sure that stability of their product was the was of top of mind. What do you make of that, that red bar on the bottom just kind of trailing off after April? You know, uh, Having really low success rates and then having, you know, have seen that that decline um, there, I, I, I think that there's, you, you know, all of the, the lower side of this, I think, is people uh, testing continuous integration tools. And so I only I'm only going to see a handful of commits. They're likely not going to be very successful, those first five commits. And then I see no more action on that as as folks are evaluating whether or not they, that Circle CI were, and I would imagine that they were probably all automation tooling across the engineering space, probably saw a lot of people go, where is my fit? Where can I get this? I need this for my team. And the uh, you know, decline there, uh, you know, that type of behavior, and it is oftentimes difficult to describe the behavior that's in the fifth percentile or the 95th percentile. But I think that this is probably a clear sign of folks uh, recognizing the opportunity for automation as they send all of their employees home and trying to, uh, uh, you know, push commits into as with onto as many tools as possible to see what they meet, meet their business needs. Yeah, I think the other thing that fascinates me about success rate is that, you know, success is the state you want to reach, but there are, there are many ways to failure. There's only really only one way to succeed, and so mm -hmm. if you if you have something that's failing. You could push another commit, it could fail again because maybe your fix wasn't good enough or it was incomplete. And you could push another commit that could happen again. You could do that a few more times. And so maybe you've pushed five commits that were all failures, but then the sixth one was the success. Well, now you you still have only a one in six success rate. And so sometimes that can trail off on the bottom, which generally would also like on that 25th percentile line there. Uh, the reason that I think about that is it could be that you're actually doing high levels of innovation and you're actually seeing failures a lot more in it. or it could be that you're, you know, brand new to this whole space and you're trying to figure out is my syntax right? Is this working? Does this test do what I want it to do? Um, there's a lot of reasons, I guess, for failure rates to go up, but that's not what we're seeing, which is interesting. So, you know, other than on this, you know, the, the bottom line there. So uh, success rates were basically the highest on record throughout, you know, April and May. Uh, again, it seems like when, uh, 
developers kind of stopped going to conferences for a while and they stopped traveling and they started working on all their software and core business and storing it up. And, and it looks like, you know, the results were seen in spades on, on the platform. Um, yeah, so our hypothesis was that people were working hard on, the, on core business stability throughout all of this. Um, I guess, Ron, what can you tell me about recovery time? Yeah, recovery times, I think, is, 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 is interesting, you know, because it, much of the narration that we've been able to apply here, like each one of these metrics, uh, like exemplifies a different kind of aspect of the, the narrative that we've been able to come up with. Uh, recovery times decline. Uh, I mean, like for, you know, as you see in the 95th percentile, we, we're getting year over year drop, but uh, that drop, you know, that, that, that comes in May or in April uh, and May, those I think are, you know, it, it's reflective of uh, if stability of your business is the ultimate goal uh, for the commits that you're pushing at those times, um, then I would expect all hands on deck to be able to resolve issues that much more, that much more rapidly. Uh, now, those aren't often the times that are the paradigms that engineers work in. Recovery time is one thing that like most teams optimize on uh, as, as much as possible, right? Getting your signal back as quickly as possible and then mitigating issues uh, as quickly as possible. Like those are, that is the feedback cycle that is at the heart of continuous integration and rapid application development. And so uh, everyone wants to see a, recrease in, a decrease in recovery time, but we, you see uh, signals like what we have here in this plot uh, that look like this, those types of drops, I think, come from uh, the ability to bring all of your folks back on, right? There's, there's this, this isn't the DevRel team that's out giving, you know, talks at conferences. This is all of the engineers that would be attending that conference as well. Uh, so like none of that travel is happening. All of those folks are back on and everyone is trying to get to a stability state that is acceptable as they try to then, uh, you know, make the changes and incorporate the new world that we all exist in. And so seeing recover recovery times drop around that time makes sense to me because I think that those are the opportunities where we're trying to solve the problems that are most core to our business. And we have the most of the, you know, the largest amount of our engineering effort uh, going towards that. And I think that the signal clearly shows that. Okay, great. Yes, yeah, so you can see that kind of since the pandemic has started, we've, we've been seeing recovery time improving. And again, people being more attentive, I think is kind of just the, the quick summary of that. Um, yeah, fewer, I, I would say that we kind of hypothesis <laughs> as fewer distractions working at home. And I, I do put for some values of distraction because um, I do not want to diminish any one situation working at home. There are children at home that, you know, are usually in schools. There are relatives to care for. There are other, you know, healthcare things going on that are very difficult to work with. And so some people are able to do way more work because they throw themselves at work while they're at home. Other people are able to do way less. And, you know, neither of those is right or wrong. I think it's just a difference that we see throughout the industry. And, uh, you know, especially for all those parents who have had their kids home since March, uh, I'm here for you. I see you. It's hard. <laughs> so, um, some branch information stuff that we came up with. Um, there's a couple things around branches that I, that we found interesting, and there was there were a few hypotheses that we wanted to test as we sliced and diced the data. And the first one was kind of you know throughout June and July of this year, um, there was a lot of social unrest and a lot of Black Lives Matter, um, you know, protests throughout the, throughout the country. And some of the branch information that kind of came up. This was an older discussion that had, I think really got resurfaced during during June and July of this year, which was, you know, this term master throughout computer science curriculum and throughout tooling. Is it really something that we have to be using or, you know, uh, can we find better language that's that's more inclusive and less, you know, comes with less baggage for all sorts of different people. And um, you know, we wanted to look into this and I, this was one of the questions that, you know, as the data scientists were slicing and dicing this, I said, hey, let's see if, if the use of a master branch has decreased year over year because of this. And, um, you know, and we, we had definitely seen some press information about it. You know, we saw Git changing that you can change um, even what the default branch is by default in the upstream Git. GitHub had, of course, published some things about how they were going to change uh, the use of master. And um, I can tell you that realistically, we have seen almost no, no, no real decline in the use of the master branch. Um, parts of this kind of I will say make me a little sad maybe is the right way to say it, but I think also not all the tooling supports it yet. And so as the tooling, you know, gets there by su supporting it or defaults to better 
better naming and better answers. I think we'll see more of that throughout the, you know, the future. Um, but I also think organizational inertia and tooling inertia is very difficult to overcome. And so if you have a bunch of automation written around, you know, checking for tags in a certain branch, and then it does some things, you know, in other, other software assembly processes and things like that, um, that's not free to change. And that, that's actually quite expensive. And I know that at Circle CI we had gone through that and, you know, we basically had that had to go through an architectural review and get a decision record written and get, you know, changes put in and, um, we felt like it was worth it. And it, you know, in the end, it didn't turn out to be weeks and weeks of effort or anything like that. But I think there are definitely software shops where that could be monumental amounts of effort uh, in terms of, you know, getting something done. And I think in a lot of other cases, it's just, it's a very simple change. And I think, you know, we'll hopefully see more of it in the future. Um, Ron, did you want to talk a little bit about kind of innovation in feature branches? Uh, well, you know, one thing that we talked about earlier was the success rate being about, or not the success rate, the, uh, well, yeah, success rate being about 60%. And, you know, there, there's, I hope that there are some folks uh, in this group that are like, I could never have my master branch or my main branch uh, sitting 60% uh, success. And so like that, that, and that's clear. And, and so we do have a little bit of ability to look in and see, you know, what is the, the default branch and then what is non-default branch. And so like, uh, you know, we have looked in the past to try and see if we could get things like, you know, a branch name deploy and maybe that was doing deploys, but because we don't have a lot of visibility down into the configuration level of those types of branches, for those pipelines, uh, it was it was more than just speculation, uh, and so, but just being able to split success rate by uh, the you know default branch and the non-default branch showed us that the default branches in general are significantly more stable. That you're not seeing uh, developers pushing, you know, or innovating on the the main branches, and you see a lot of that innovation happening on the feature branches. So success rate eighty percent on default. Uh, at the 50th percentile, and then it's it's higher for, uh, or it's it's lower than that for the non-default branches. And that 58% being around 60 is 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 what I would expect to see for teams that really are trying to uh, you know run their CI on all commits, and that their commits are trying to build new services, new features. Like that's going to be a success rate that that is going to be reasonable. But no one wants to see their uh, main service. Uh, in the red. And so clearly when we saw that, we split those apart, seeing that the, the success rate is much higher for the default branch uh, makes sense to us. And this is, you know, there are many different types of Git flows that organizations are using now. Uh, trunk-based deployment though is not something that is, even the, the ways that trunk-based was originally kind of uh, uh, ideated, uh, a lot of the teams that are doing uh, a version of trunk-based uh, uh, development, uh, you know, still kind of feature branch for, you know, for a number of commits before they commit to, to the main line, like all of those things, I think, are going to like increase as we see more types of Git flows for different organizational needs. Uh, there, are, I mean, as our tooling becomes more sophisticated, as uh, our VCS becomes more sophisticated, we do get these opportunities to have a, a, a more a mature Git flow paradigm that we operate in, and we will start seeing more differentiation from these different types of branches. And uh, ideally, uh, you know, success rate of your mainline branch, 80% uh, might be too low, but that might be a, a bar that your company is unwilling to, to see get that low. Yeah, I think at a lot of companies, what we'll see is, you know, mainline is the thing that everybody's re re everybody relies upon. And so that being read means that every other developer is possibly blocked or unable to do their work. And so, you know, mainline, you want to keep it the, you know, 90 plus percentile if you can do it. Um, and then you'll see these other branches. The reason you have all these other branches is because no one wants to be the person who broke the mainline build. And so they have these other branches where they're testing that and validating, okay, my change looks good before I put it into mainline. Because the last thing I want to do is have, you know, every other engineer standing around saying, hey, can you fix this so I can do work? Um, and so that this, this supports that, you know, we do see, you know, feature branch development and you know a lot of people say well feature development is an or feature branch development is an anti-pattern and i guess i would say yes sometimes um but it also depends on the length and the duration of that feature branch you know if it lasts a couple hours long enough to do a pull request and do some validation and get it merged i don't think that's that's really anti to any of the trunk based development you know kind of philosophy 
if it lasts for years because you have a feature branch that's you know never integrated, um, you have your own set of problems that you will find out about eventually. So they're coming. Yeah, yeah, and so you can see that the duration on default branches is faster than every other um, the, the non default branches at every percentile. So basically, the mainline branch people work on test engineering. They work on making it fast. They work on making the feedback good. When it's non default branches they're slower. And that could be because you're adding new tests or learning how to write new tests, or you're putting in sleep statements and print statements to figure out, you know, what values are, are where and when. Um, but those are, that's just part of, I guess, developing on, on multiple branches. And we also see, see recovery time lower on the default branch in every percentile. And this again, makes sense. If you think about it, when there's other people that rely on mainline, they're, they're watching recovery time, they're watching mainline a whole lot more to make sure that fewer people are impacted by a red build. And so we're gonna make that red build the shortest duration we can. And so, you know, recovery time increases. And that's just, again, this is kind of just classic continuous delivery philosophy. And it does, all those things, I guess, are shown in our data sets, which is cool. Um, and then, you know, we, we were able to ask a little bit about some de de development practices and see what works. And, um, one of the things that we were able to see is, you know, when you look at organizations and how many contributors are in the organization, success rate really doesn't correlate with company size at all. Um, if you have 800, if you have 800 contributors in your GitHub org or you have four, we can't really tell that just by looking at success rate. Um, I don't know if that's interesting to everybody. I found it interesting. <laughs> so, um, duration is longest for teams of one, uh, which I think makes sense because uh, if you're a team of one, first off, you might not be a team. Uh, so, but secondly, you might not care if it takes you a long time to get feedback because there's no one else waiting on you. And I think, I think there's a social construct there where when you know you're in the way of somebody else, you will do extra work to make sure that it's, you know, faster, better understood, taken care of in a better way. And I think that that's kind of the things that we miss um, when you're one. Recovery time decreases with the increased size of your team, which I found, which was up to about 200. And the reason I wrote that is after that, the data gets a little fuzzy and the, the, the data set's small enough that you can't really draw a lot from it. We don't have a ton of teams that are over 200 engineers that use us all at once on the same repositories. <laughs> so, um, you know, there's many companies that have more than 200 engineers, but they're usually not all working on the exact same repository. Um, so, uh, but recovery time decreases. So basically the more people you're impacting with a red build, probably the faster you are to recover it, I think is really what that's telling us. And Mike, and you, you think that that's more the social construct than hands on deck or just a combination of those two? I, I think it's, I mean, I think it's a social construct, but I mean, I, I know, it, you know, the last engineering team I ran, when certain things were read, there were literally 70 engineers that basically couldn't merge. And if they can't merge, you know, they're sitting there blocking or queuing change or they're context switching into something else. And now, whatever work they had committed for that day, you know, is, is at jeopardy. And, and I think that, I think it's the social construct more than the, you need 200 people watching the build. I think it's the person that puts the commit in there is like really watching their build to make sure it's okay because they know there's 70 or hundred or 200 people that are going to be relying on that build for the rest of the day or, the, you know, overnight or whatever. Um, longest recovery times are from teams of one, which again, kind of supports our, you don't have a social construct here. I know like, you know, for my little chat bot that I play with, if the, if the build turns red, I might not get back to that for three weeks because literally no one cares except for me. Um, and so basically, you know, in summary, like performance is better with more than one contributor, it, like from every outcome that we can measure, it, it, you're better with you when you have more people to work with. And so, you know, the takeaway here was that software is collaborative, which I don't think is a new thing to think about, but I don't think we talk about it a lot when we talk about data and metrics. And, you know, this is a thing that we were able to prove out, you know, in just looking at the outcomes and success rates of team sizes and number of contributors that you have, you can see that, you know, putting more people working on a project is going to give you better outcomes. And whether that's because it's, you know, purely social construct or whether it's because you get, um, you know, new minds and new approaches, I don't think it's one or the other. I think it's a, it's an and, and, and you know, it, there could be a slider there depending on how much value you're getting out of either of those. And you know, there's probably other indicators as well. Um, one of the other questions that we went through with the data with was, uh, how's this is don't deploy on Friday? Is that a really a real thing anymore? Um, you know, when I think, when I hear like we don't deploy on Fridays, I definitely think more about 
kind of IT from a while ago um, in general, but that doesn't necessarily mean that, that we've moved past that. It could be that, you know, my bias has changed because I work in a, in a technology company versus a, a, an old manufacturing, you know, IT background and things like that. Um, but to look at this, we saw there was 70% less throughput on weekends just in general. And so when you think about a seven day schedule, you know, Monday through Friday, there's a whole lot more traffic than on Saturday and Sunday. Not surprising. There's a lot fewer people working. My AWS bill goes down. I'm happier. Um, but we see 11% less throughput on Friday. And we do all this in UTC measurement because it's the only sane way to even talk about dates and times on this planet. Um, and so we see 11% less throughput on Friday's UTC, but we see 9% less on Mondays. And so the reason that we kind of do this Monday, Friday comparison is Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday are the only days of the week where the 24 hour period is a business day for everywhere in the world. Because Monday, you know, you're actually, it's Sunday in, the, in North America for portions of it. And Friday, you're, you know, the weekend in Europe before you're the weekend in, in North America. And so, but when you look at this and you kind of normalize it out, if you see, well, you're 9% lower on Monday and you're 11% lower on Friday, we can pretty much say that that's not a significant change between Mondays and Fridays. More people take off on Fridays too, just generally looking at, you know, the way people do holiday scheduling. So we don't really see that there's a significant drop off on Friday in terms of workflows. And I think that kind of tells us that this, uh, you know, we're not seeing a whole lot of people holding back from pushing code on Fridays, which um, makes me happy. <laughs> I guess you should be able to push code hopefully when you, when you need to. And, and, you know, it's, you can stop, you can reduce your risk by not doing something or by working on other ways to reduce your risk. And hopefully, you know, when people are using CI and automation, they found other ways to, uh, mitigate that risk in some way. Mike, you showed that the, there was a 70% drop. Uh, what, are the, what are the workflows that are being run on Saturday and Sunday? A lot of times it's scheduled jobs. And so, it, you know, whether it's, you know, there's, we run a job that submits a report to a manager on a Monday morning. So it's in their inbox when they start, or it could be, um, you know, we have a certain set of tests that maybe take a very long time to run because they're very intricate and very complex. And so we only run those on weekends because we don't need to run them on every commit. Um, it could just be that certain repositories just run every hour, no matter what, throughout the weekend on the weekends. And so they're still just being counted on the weekends. Uh, it could be the hobbyist playing on the weekends. Uh, it could be, you know, it's crunch time and Cyberpunk 2077 is supposed to come out and, and the developers just keep having to work because uh, they keep moving the date back. So could be any of those things. Excellent. Uh, and the last thing that we have kind of on here is just language trends. And um, I love throwing up language trends, mostly to start debate among other people, because um, you can always pick your favorite language and, and fight for or against it. Um, in, in, in this sample size, which was about a month long, this was the percentage of jobs we saw. Anything below 0.083% just doesn't register, which is interesting because, you know, languages that are quite popular even still like closure, um, which is what a lot of Circle CI is in for what it's worth, um, you know, doesn't even show up in terms of, uh, you know, registering here. And you'll, you'll also see that a lot of, um, I guess there's a lot of mark, markup, markdown, and then, uh, you know, kind of, I would say simpler languages, which maybe is a, a not the right way to describe that, but um, things that necessarily don't have a full test suite all the time, like HTML. I don't think there's a lot of people writing tests to validate HTML. They're usually validating something that generates the HTML more so. Um, so this, this is the languages in our sample. In terms of throughput, this is how often things are going onto the platform. Uh, Ruby is one of our most popular, you know, people that are using it on CircleCI, and that's been that way for forever. And I think that, you know, that's not a big surprise for us. Um, TypeScript and Go have both jumped up over year over year in terms of where they are in the rankings here. So um, definitely those are growing pretty quickly. Uh, Docker file sneaking its way in at number 20. A lot of people building Docker artifacts. And so you start to see Docker files is just one of the main things that, that jobs are, are circling around. Um, language success rates. I find this one interesting because again, I don't think a lot of people are running tests using CSS. I think they're doing simple things with CSS, maybe assembling it, maybe running less or doing you know some of the other kind of tooling to build it out. Shell kind of the same way. I don't think a lot of people are running very advanced test suites in Shell. I mean, you can use BATS or you can use other tooling to do that, but I would bet in most cases, it's a Shell job that's doing something else with maybe another artifact, maybe putting it in S3 or, you know, getting something from an external resource and prepping it for the next step of a pipeline. Um, and a lot of times shells just exit zero no matter what happens unless you've, you know, ex explicitly written it not to. 
Um, Docker files kind of the same way. And so, you know, even when you get down to a HashiCorp configuration language and number seven, so there's a lot of Terraform that, you know, Terraform scripts that go through CI and things like that. But Go is kind of the first, you know, language that I would say that, you know, usually comes with a healthy test suite with a lot of applications. And, um, you know, I, I just find that interesting that Go is above TypeScript and JavaScript. And then, and then you get back, you know, more into the, like the kind of the dynamic languages and you get to the static languages more toward the bottom. Um, and then at recovery times, Go being number one was, a, that was surprising to me. Um, just that, you know, apparently the Go developers are just on it. They, they want to make sure that their pipelines are green and maybe they have, because they have lots of contributors and they want to make sure that everybody else can be active and, and successful. JavaScript being right there is not surprising to me. Um, and then toward the other end, you know, recovery time being longer for C++ or Swift, doesn't, that doesn't surprise me either, both because sometimes those languages are quite complex to work on solutions but also because you have to build an artifact before you can validate it. And so in, in some cases you have to wait through that build time, which just means your duration is longer, which, you know, duration is an input into recovery time because your recovery time has to at least go through one duration before it can be recovered. Um, and then duration, you know, you'll see things at the top are, are, you know, shell and HashiCorp configuration language, whereas at the end of bottom end, you have a lot of the, a lot of the uh, you know the statically typed languages, and then and then Ruby doesn't show up super well this time, um, but that, that's okay. Uh, last year it was really weird because PHP showed up in a really good light in almost all of these measurements, um, which I thought was a weird anomaly, and but it did let me tell everybody that they should be using PHP for everything, which uh, I enjoyed because I didn't mean it. But um, so this year I think it, you know PHP groups much better. Where you know I expected to group closely with Python and Ruby in most cases on most of these charts, and it does. So for a couple of final thoughts, um, you know, when you kind of map what the outcomes are from our CI, you know, data set and you put them back kind of overlaying um, the, some of the academic research that's come out of the, the state of DevOps reports, you know, we usually map just kind of, if you're at the 50th percentile in our data set, you're showing up, you know, between high, between medium and high performing in a lot of cases, just if that's if you're at our 50th percentile. So that's just, you know, if you're average at using CI, more or less with Circle CI, you're going to be between a medium and high performing team. Once you start to make a little more investment in it, you can shift up the high performance uh, very quickly and very fairly, you know, with, it's a fairly straightforward path. I won't say it's easy because writing tests and making sure that they have good coverage and things like that is not easy, but it's a well-known path. Um, and so if you're average using CI, you'll be on the right path is basically where we're at. Um, yeah, our most frequent CI users have more outcomes on all four metrics. And so like the more you're leaning into this, the better you're gonna do in terms of output of both your CI measurements, but also just your traditional DevOps outcomes, um, you know, the way they're measured and configured. And more, collabor more collaborators means better outcomes. And I think that that was one of my favorite things just because I love putting a human element on software. And so, you know, if you have more people to work with and you can do a little more, you know, whether it's collaboration or socializing or whiteboarding or whatever to get your, your code through, um, it leads to better outcomes and we can show that with the data. That's kind of the end of the presentation. Uh, just a reminder, CircleCI is hiring because we are hiring like mad. Um, whether if, you know, if you're interested in the, this data set or you're interested in engineering how we get this data set or the platform that CircleCI runs on, um, feel free to apply. Uh, I just want to say, you know, thanks. I'm Mike, and that, that was Ron. And so I think we can switch over to Q and A. All right, we have about two minutes left. So if anyone has something, pop it in the Q and A chat. And um, thanks for a great discussion, y'all. Let's monitor that, see what we've got, and uh, we'll go from there. Must have been a great detailed presentation. No questions left. <laughs> All right. We do have two minutes. If anybody wants to ask anything, though. All right. Well, Mike and Michael and Ron, thanks so much for a great presentation. Um, that's all we have time for today. Thanks for joining us, everyone. And the webinar recording and slides will be up online on the website later today. And we look forward to seeing all of you at another CNCF webinar soon. All right. Thank everybody you so much. Have a great day. Thank Thanks you so much. Bye. Bye.